What we want to do today is talk about this thing called the culture matic. And um, as our rules of engagement, I want to use you know, my training at the Harvard Business School. The great thing about, one of the great things about the Harvard Business School is they really teach you how to teach. They spend a week just drilling you. And the name of the game there is engagement. It's making a connection with your audience and indeed making your audience feel not like an audience, passive recipients of what's happening at the, f at the front of the room, but people who are fully engaged in and possessed of the power to intervene at any moment with a question or a comment. You know, it seems to you, wait a second, what? Th that's a good question. What? You can ask that question. Uh, or any other kind of question, but please sing out. Let's not leave the questions to the very end. Let's, let's sing out as, as we go. So my mission here is to tell you about this thing called a culture matic. Um, and it seems to me one of the reasons I wrote the book and built the category is to capture just a ton of stuff that's happening uh, in the marketing world. The strange and wonderful things going on everywhere you look. And I thought, these are not necessarily all of them different things. These may very well be the same thing. And if we can put them in a single category and write the the software, as it were, write the grammar from which these things come, then we will have clarified something in the world of, of marketing. So I want to show you these culture matics, talk about how and why they work, and, and also to encourage you to make a culture matic of your own. It'd be absolutely, Tara's going to end with that suggestion, and please do, if you, if you work on something that could be called a culture matic, please give me a shout. It seems, just to put this in the, a still larger context, um, it seems to me this is an interesting moment in the history of marketing, that something really is changing in the history of marketing. I think what we're seeing is the eclipse of mass marketing. You know, after World War II, marketers, the job of the marketer was to bang the drum as loudly as possible on behalf of the product or the, the brand. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, it was to load up the canons of mass media. And typically in TV spots that were one, you know, broadcast on one of three uh, t television uh, uh, channels and just fire them at the consumer until there was no doubt about that Pontiac made excitement, right? It was that, that kind of just total repetition. And, you know, some of the language of marketing actually feels like the language of warfare, right? And we talk about targets and we talk about... It feels to me like that, I mean, some of that is still crucial, and it's part of our toolkit. It's never going to go away as part of our toolkit, but other things are kind of entering into the instruments we have at our disposal, and we could call this the era of a kind of murmur marketing. But the name of the game now is to use a quieter voice, a more playful, more nuanced signal. That's the kind of stuff to which consumers now, the trouble with all of that bang the drum marketing that happened after World War II is that it kind of inured the consumer. They now have this hard candy shell and certain mass marketing messages just bounce off that shell, right? People just go, they just tune out, like done. Um, and so we need to get in under that barrier and sometimes that takes nuanced and playful and counterintuitive. The real name of the game here is enchantment, is one of the words here. The other word is, is surprising and counter-expectational and, and, and unexpected. That's the way we get, it seems to me, that's the voice of the new marketing. We could call this artisanal marketing. All of you know about the artisanal trend in the world of food, right? Alice Waters, Chez Panisse, 1973. You know, it's, it's a kooky enterprise when it, when it happens in Northern California. And it's the kind of thing, you know, as an anthropologist, you look at contemporary culture, you see things come and go. If you'd asked me in 1974, has this got legs? I would have said, absolutely not. This is one of those crazy things that happens in Northern California, <laughs> and, and it will never get out of Berkeley. Uh, but in point of fact, when Michelle Obama put uh, a vegetable garden on the lawn of the White House, she was answering the call issued by uh, Chez Panisse and Alice Waters 40 years before. You can draw an absolute connection between that Berkeley experiment and what Michelle Obama uh, does to the, the lawn of the White House. You know, we live in a, 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 an incredibly um, overcharged ideological environment, and when Michelle Obama put in the vegetable garden, I, you know, I sort of covered my ears thinking we were going to have this great chorus of, that's hallowed ground. You can't do that to the lawn of the White House. And what you got from everybody was, oh, that's a very interesting idea. We're thinking of a vegetable garden of our own. This trend was more powerful than politics 
Uh, it had gone, it had started as this kooky thing from Northern California, and it had colonized the whole of American culture. And now, of course, it, you know, I was in an airport trying to get breakfast a couple of months ago, and I had an artisanal breakfast from Wendy's, and I thought, oh, <laughs> you know, here we go. You know, this is going to be just painful. But in point of fact, it was pretty darn good. It was much better for the fact that Alice Waters started this trend 40 years ago. So that trend has come to food, it's come to spirits, um, and it's come to marketing in a sense. So that old notion of a mass marketing where you punt things in from the 40 yard line, now we're talking about things that are rooted in our culture um, and uh, that draw from and give to culture. Uh, and most of all, we're looking at things that are funny, odd, and surprising. That's the single most important signature of these culture matics is that you go, your first reaction is what? And your second reaction is, oh. You know, that, that used to be, imagine trying to pitch that to General Motors in 1955. We want to create this marketing experiment, the reaction to which is what? And oh. You know, people would have said, no, absolutely not. You have the wrong idea of marketing. Please leave the profession. Right? But that's actually now what works. That's what seals the deal. That's what sends the message, is that first reaction of, oh, that's odd, and the second reaction of, oh, that's charming. OK. So just to define culture matics, they are a marketing experiment that makes meaning and value for the brand. And when I use these two terms, I'm evoking uh, anthropology on the one hand and economic, economics on the other. And that's sort of my career has been trying to, to to bring together economics and anthropology. And, and those are the crucial, when you're talking about culture, you're often talking about meaning. And the question is, how do you extract value, the economist's value, from that meaning? So one of these culture matics is designed precisely to evoke both meaning and value, to extract value from meaning. We can think about these things as stunts. Remember, that used to be one of the, an important part of the vocabulary of public relations was staging a stunt. And these are stunts of a kind. They're stunts that, the, the, the deal about stunts is that you would create something completely counter-expectational, and the mass media wouldn't be able to, you know, tear themselves away from, you know, 100 people dressed as doctors and, and uh, running through the streets of Manhattan, right? Everybody would have to pay attention to that because it was just so strange. That stuff, sometimes did, the best stunts, I would argue, we're working with culture in a very interesting and productive way. Culture matics mean to be stunts with that difference, that they're always working with culture in what we hope is a, is a particular, um, particularly productive way. David gave us some great diagnostics this morning. Uh, he talked about engagement, reach, cost, and satisfaction, and I thought I would just use those to talk about the culture matic. And um, engagement here all comes, as I was just saying, from that notion of surprise and delight and, and enchantment. Um, reach. Is it's usually these things are really fast acting kind of events, right? Uh, they're like the stunts, which would happen quickly and then disperse. Culture matics very often happen quickly and then they disperse. What we're doing here is igniting the social media, the meme effect. Um, uh, and the cost is, uh, here's the really good news, the cost is fantastically small. The cost of most of these culture matics is so small, you can run 10 and 20 of them uh, and, and not have put much strain on, on your budget. The satisfaction, I think, is very intense. And I think, really, for millennials especially, this is the kind of stuff that engages them. And I've, as an anthropologist, done a lot of work interviewing, uh, working with millennials one way or another. And, uh, and you can tell that this playful stuff, this counter-expectational stuff, is precisely the stuff that captures them. So here we go. That's my preamble. And here's the, the presentation. I'll take a breath, because you can hear I sort of hydroplane a little bit. I just, something about the intensity of the moment, and I, and I don't breath, breathe deeply enough. So the world is changing. This is really my big finding and my big deliverable, and now we're done. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Really great to, great to meet you, and uh, thank you for your patience. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> uh, so the world is changing. And we, we know it's changing, and we know our response to that, the, the turbulence of our world is intense because everyone keeps telling us to calm down and that it's not so bad and we'll sort things out. But in point of fact, there's a kind of subtext here, and the subtext is, <laughs> oh, oh my god, this is even worse than we possi thought possible. 
so we live in a fantastically difficult, you know, turbulent time. Um, and we see the reaction from, you know, the corporate America, I think, has shares it in this anxiety. And I was astounded to learn recently that corporate America has $5 trillion in cash reserves. $5 trillion in cash reserves. And it's there because, partly it's because we're coming through this prolonged and uh, unattractive economic period of, of, uh, of, of this period of difficulty. The other party, the other problem here is that things have changed so profoundly. I think a lot of cash is sitting on the sidelines as the corporation goes, so how do we do this again? So what is the, what the, is the you know, the four C's and the four P's we learned about in business school, those aren't as obvious as they used to be. Um, a woman at uh, NYU, the Stern School, recently published a book that says, no competitive advantage is sustainable. And that used to be the name of the game, right? You'd come up with some, your own particular way of creating value. You would lock it up legally. You'd protect it with your own efforts. And then you had a way, you know, that was your, your fountain of value. And, and maybe in the long term, somebody would come and take it away from you. But in the short term, you had a gusher to work with. And that's, that's part of the, the new dynamism of the world in which we live. Somebody can come up with a brand new, extraordinarily productive idea, but the chances of other people coming to, to take that from us are extraordinarily are, are big. So it's a time of real turbulence, but there's lots of good news, and that's where the culture matics come in. We live in a fluid culture. We live in a playful world filled with active and eager consumers. I mean, you know, that old notion after World War II that the consumer was a couch potato. Right, who would sort of sit there and, and watch TV and nod off occasionally, but, you know, but completely passive, passively the recipient of the mass, uh, messages that we fired at him or her, we know that creature stole away under the cover of darkness. And what we have now are fantastically engaged consumers who watch and second guess everything we do. They've all taken a course in film criticism, thank you very much. So when they're watching any piece of TV, they're going, that's an interesting casting choice. I really, I'm not sure it would have made that. <laughs> so that's a kind of blessing. Lots of bad things, turbulent things happening, but we have a new species to work with in, in the form of an active, eager consumer. Experience marketing, I think, to that extent, has a new waterfront. This is Lisa Schwarzbaum who is the uh, film critic for Entertainment Weekly. She's one of my favorite uh, film critics. She works for that very interesting uh, magazine. And a couple of years ago, she said, you know what I'm noticing that Hollywood is doing new things. What I'm noticing from Hollywood is that in the way that those South American novelists had done about 30 years ago, suddenly Hollywood is engaging in something called magic realism. You think about all of these films as cases in point, right? Where it's perfectly okay in the course of a narrative for sheep to rain from the heavens or, or boats to, to fly or, or humans, for that matter, to fly. Supernatural things are allowed to happen in a natural world. And I think several decades of that have made a difference to the American consumer as a film goer. You know, all of us have absorbed um, that image of the world being a world of enchantment. It's, you know, the necessary condition is industrial light and magic who could do special effects that were fantastically special. You know, really just amazing. You can't believe your eyes, they're so good. But that's just the necessary condition. I think the sufficient um, condition is that we are a culture that plays in that way, that plays with those materials, that believes of it, enchantment in ways we didn't always. And it's not just, so the, the consumer, expects the world to blossom with magic and wonder. That's kind of a standing expectation now. It's not just in Hollywood. It's in the course of an ordinary, uh, you know, people commit some part of their life energies to this notion that you should practice random kindness and sen senseless acts of beauty. So this is a student from the University of Chicago who's doing the logo for the University of Chicago in Paris. And you can find a whole a whole uh, stream of these photographs as students stage these, these stunts uh, variously uh, around the world. This is a, it's a, not a perfect photo, <laughs> but you can see somebody's done a Pac-Man image here as this creature could be seen to. So there's play everywhere these days. 
And that's partly because popular culture lost the adjective sometime in the last 10 years. Popular culture went from being popular culture to just being culture. I have to tell you that when you go to a, a faculty meeting at a, a Northeastern University, it will go nameless. Um, when the topic of TV comes up in the course of conversation, the, uh, the academics always say stuff like, well, of course, we don't have a TV. Or we have a TV, but it's black and white. We never watch it. Or we only get what channel. We don't get cable. Now, eventually, and I just I keep my mouth shut because I know exactly what's going on here. This is academic theater. You ne only need to wait about 40 minutes until the sherry takes effect. And once it's taken effect, these people begin to demonstrate an astonishing knowledge of the law and order <laughs> corpus. Thank you very much. Because they watch TV all the time. Thank you very much. But they belong to my generation, a boomer generation, that's slightly embarrassed by popular culture. Like, you really don't admit to it, right? You watch it, but it's your guilty secret. You don't let anybody else know, and, unless the sherry has taken you. Um, but that's not true for millennials. It wasn't true. The swing generation here was Gen X. And, and but for millennials, it's just popular culture is, is just our culture. We're not embarrassed by it. It's just a sea in which we swim. And we have this passionate proprietary feeling about it. And we're really good at making it, criticizing it, and when possible, making it. Of course, this is a generation, you know, the barriers to entry have fallen extraordinarily. Anybody can have a, a, a production studio in their, in their basement or on their laptop, for that matter. Um, so that's, that's that. But it's not just there in the new media. It's every, this, this kind of ingenuity is everywhere, right? Somebody's had the brilliant idea of taking the, the lowest tech answer to marketing in the world is one of these things that you make up on your computer. You print with your printer. You stick it to a local telephone pole. And somebody's had a little fun with it. Uh, but there it is, uh, a, nice, uh, a nice exercise. And as I say, you know, you don't need new media to make this happen. So there's new interest here, there's new engagement, there are new possibilities. And all of this represents, I think, for us, an opportunity to work with culture. And here's a guy who worked with culture to spectacular effect. This is Dr. Kahn. He's an admiral in the US military. He's an MD, and he's the head of the uh, CDC the Center for Disease Control. This man, I mean, we all think we have responsibilities and we have stress. This guy has so much responsibility, it would make most, most of us weep most of the time. But look at him, he's fine, he's fine with it. He's a deeply intelligent, interesting, creative guy who has a very real problem and the problem is every American should do more than they do to get ready for disaster. Because disaster is going to happen in one shape or other. It's going to happen to everybody at some point in their lifetimes. The trouble with that message, if you give it in a conventional way, is that uh, people go, yeah, right, I'm going to do that next weekend. The participation rate's unbelievably low. Like about 8% of Americans have actually made some effort to get ready for some disaster. So poor Dr. Khan is thinking, geez, this is my responsibility to get people to get ready. And they won't. Really? What am I going to do? Well, it turns out he has a blog. And one day, he uses his blog to do this. He says, let's pretend there's a zombie invasion. What would you do to get ready? And, and wouldn't it be funny if you got ready and people said, oh, that's a great idea. And the participation rate went from 8% to like 22% overnight, right? Because it turns out that Americans who won't get ready for a disaster that will certainly happen <laughs> will get ready for a disaster that can't ever, ever happen. <laughs> but it takes a very clever Dr. Khan to go, oh, this is, a, this is hot and cold. I mean, what's hotter than zombies, right? It's been fantastically. It's been great for uh, AMC. Uh, you know, it's been anybody who had a piece of this action is is in is in great shape because zombies went from it was as kooky as something in in Berkeley, right, and then suddenly it just stormed popular culture like vampires a few years ago. Our culture ha sees these great kind of migrations. An idea comes and just 
colonizes our culture and keeps moving, something else happens. The, <coughs> excuse me. The marketers who can tap that in an in interesting, engaging way have fantastic resources at their disposal. This is the stuff of which marketing genius and mar marketing riches are born. So the takeaway here is we can use a culture matic to help ourselves to some piece of culture. We can connect, we can leverage the buzz and the heat of culture. And as I say, there's nothing hotter than zombies at the moment. It won't be zombies for long. I did a presentation for uh, Bertelsmann, a German conglomerate. Um, and uh, a woman, and this is about five years ago, I guess. And uh, a woman in the audience came up to me later and said, oh, one of my slides was, when do vampires die? Because we were just in the throes of that vampire trend. And you knew it was going to have to go eventually, but, but it, was, it was upon us. And, uh, and this woman was the editor, the chief of Random House. And she said, you know, this drives me nuts. I know this trend is passing. I also know I have editors out there signing up more novelists who can deliver a vampire. So it's a chronic kind of problem for everybody. The, and I, OK, so <laughs> sorry. It's easy to get me distracted and, and off on another topic. So I'm going to resist that temptation. OK, so this is Max Weber. Maybe possibly the most important sociologist of the 19th century, who looked at the world and said, you know what? The art world is becoming joyless. It's so rational. It's so industrial. It's so mechanical. It's so um, controlled by the play of the marketplace. It's been so stripped of the magic of folklore, right? That was stripped out of our culture sometime in the 19th century. Certain aspects of religion were stripped out of our culture in the 19th century. So you get the sociologist coming along and saying, you know, this is a problem. Eventually, we're going to have to re-enchant the world. That's his proposition. It takes 150 years, but we see it happening now. Oops. So. Let's look at a few I events in the world that I think serve as cases in point that show how discovering culture, leveraging culture to release cultural meaning and economic value for the brand can, uh, can give us a, a glimpse of the possibilities here. Here's an example. I've done a lot of work for Coke over the years. I wish to goodness I could tell you that I worked on this campaign. Somebody, I didn't. Somebody at Coke had the very bright idea of saying, they looked at sort of contemporary culture, sort of in a Weberian moment, and they said, um, you know, what's grimmer than a security camera? You know, we've installed them in the world, and they just end up being kind of chronicles of human misery. They're on we only consult them to look at them when something bad has happened, when a crime takes place. We go to the security footage and have a look. Surely there's some way of, of using this technology to a happier, more joyful more Coca-Cola purpose. So the old version of that ad, you'll remember it from the 60s and the 70s, 
I'd like to buy the world a Coke. And what's the song? Teach it. Teach the world to sing. Thank you. Right. Which was beautiful in its way. Uh, but if you tried to you tried to, that ad in these circumstances, people would laugh you off the stage. Um, it's something as odd and, and strange as this. It's like it's this back to what and oh that's going on here, right? A security camera, as bad as that quality necessarily is in a security camera, I mean, let's go back to 1965 and imagine telling the, the senior vice president for marketing at Coca-Cola that we want to use the best, I'm sorry, the worst grade of video on the planet <laughs> for our ad. I mean, just no way that that's going to happen. But here it works brilliantly because it's all about using this, finding a way to use the security camera in an interesting, more imaginative way. Uh, so the takeaway here is finding a little piece of the world that's there, right? Everyone knows about these uh, security cameras. Everybody's seen them. Somebody had the bright idea of looking at one of these and going, oh, you know what? That's kind of, we could do something with that. And um, turning it on its head and creating something unexpected and enchanted. So here we've got an example of somebody doing almost a literal take on magic realism, Lisa Schwartzbaum's notion of magic realism at the movies. Here, here we've got somebody who's saying, well, it looks good on the screen. What happens if we made it happen in the world? And that's a really big piece of the culture matic, is staging an event in the world. That's why they're a little bit stunt-like. right? They're in that tradition. Here we go. You know, because it's French, it goes on for like six and a half minutes, which is more, <laughs> more time than I, I can ask you to give to it. But, uh, but isn't it lovely? I mean, isn't it just, it's like, oh, I mean, imagine, you know, driving, riding your bicycle uh, somewhere in Paris, and suddenly you watch a tiger run past you. I mean, how wonderful. Uh, it's murmur marketing. It's anti-mass marketing. It appears, and then it disappears. And who will not? You know, let's say it's seen by 2,000 people. That's plenty, because all of those people will talk about it. Thank you very much. The trick is how to attach your brand in a subtle kind of way, right? You don't want to have the logo you know, Im Im uh, imposed on the tiger. You want to work that into the signal somehow. But hey, it's murmur marketing. That's kind of what we, that's what we do these days. Exactly. I don't know. I mean, I found this <laughs> online, and I have no idea who did it. And I think it may be kind of like an art project because, yeah. hey, they're French. So, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> so here's Gatorade doing something that I think. You know, Gatorade has a problem. Nike has a problem. Several of the people in the sports world have a problem, and that is they're addicted to high price athletes as celebrity endorsers. And those people have a problem, thank you very much. Yeah. Turns out they have every possible problem. <laughs> Substance abuse, you know, you name it, a celebrity athlete can, will think at some point to do it, and they take a piece of your brand with you when they do it. So the question is, and they get paid so much money they are as gods. It's almost impossible for us to think about them as m mortals with whom we have anything to do. So here's Gatorade taking a new approach to athletics as a source of cultural meaning for their brand. Welcome to the 87th meeting between the State Liners of Phillipsburg and the Red Rovers of East. 27 yard field goal attempt. And it's blocked. This one is over. Seven, seven, a sister kisser. Time might be worse than a loss. We think we have a score to settle. 
Gatorade has chosen to team up with the towns of Phillipsburg, New Jersey, and Easton. We're inviting the guys from the 93 team to strap on the helmet and the shoulder pads and replay that game to determine the true champion once and for all. I said to the coach, we had to kind of come out and sweat and warm up, and he said, no, we go full pads every day. And I'm like, coach, we're in our 30s. <laughs> come on now. My first thought was, who are the crazies that are going to suit it up and try and play football? You shouldn't be doing this. 15 years away from the game, you're just not going to be able to get that kind of finesse in a day. Your eyes are, are certainly showing concussion. A lot of people out there saying you can't do it. Let's prove them wrong. One, two, three, two. 10,000 tickets sold out in 90 minutes. The field temperature right now is at 100 degrees. They look at your age and they said, you can't do it. They didn't look at your heart. They said to look inside of you. Get the extra on and play the damn game. No matter how old you are, 8 to 80, blind, crippled, or crazy, you're always an athlete. So, here, you know, Speaking to the heart of a community, these little towns battling it out every year in the fall, and then this, this, this one contest that won't go down, that won't disappear because it ended in a tie, replaying that, and then getting guys who are now in their th 30s, right, well beyond <laughs> their physical prime, get them to, to go back onto the field of battle is just so, it's a beautiful narrative, although richer for the fact that you're dealing with real athletes working at the limit of their competence, thank you. Not gods, but uh, very real people. So here is um, the T I'm not going to play you the whole thing here, not because it's French, but because uh, I'm running out of time. So uh, this is the, the Coca-Cola company staging an outbreak of enchantment on a university campus. I thought that was the high point, a balloon animal, of course. But this is a culture matic in almost its purest form. I mean, what's more banal, count, taken for granted, than a vending machine, right? And to suddenly make it come to life, to make it a happiness machine, a sharing machine, it really is to deliver meanings that go straight to the brand uh, and stay there, I think, for some time. So there are a lot of examples here, but I really am running out of time. So I think I'm going, let's just see what's good here. This, this is a great project done by Virgin Mobile where they, dr they went out and hired actors to play celebrities. Um, and, they, and they put them onto red carpets and they put them into openings and, and, people, and, and, they, and the, the uh, celebrity press started to pay attention and follow them around with cameras and the whole thing happened and somebody said, you know, aren't, aren't you worried that the ce celebrity press are going to feel like you've tricked them? And somebody said, well, ask the celebrity press. And the celebrity press said, this is perfectly OK with us. I mean, have you met these celebrities? They're not much better than artificial people, as it is. So these people are really not very different from, your, from Brangelina. Um, so a very nice piece of mischief, I think. More mischief, where you, Wendy's, you dress, you dress somebody at the counter up in the Wendy's wig. Um, this was a really interesting piece of work by uh, Ford uh, for the Fiesta movement. This was their subcompact, the Fiesta that was, uh, they hadn't had a subcompact in the market for a long time and so they really made an effort to dress this up and they did a beautiful, they, they took, I think it was 100 kids, gave them cars and asked them to do, 
sort of stage their own culture matics and to phone home, and it was fantastically successful. Um, the Knight Foundation is, has been doing things they call random acts of culture. It's a kind of smart mobs, the culture matic take on smart, smart mobs. Uh, okay, I'll just end with this because it's a project that's dear to my heart because I'm working on it at the moment. It's the Boston Book Festival is this kind of, um, you know, dear old uh, lady of the Boston literary uh, 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 circles. Um, it's it's very old and 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 it's v and it's very successful, uh, and it uh, stages uh, literary readings in magnificent church, ch that magnificent magnificent church at Copley Square. Uh, the trouble is, it's kind of hermetically sealed. If 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 you read books, you know about this. If you don't read books, you have no idea that it happens. You just drop by Copley Square and you think, oh, wonder what that is, and you keep going. So the question was. Could we use a culture matic to stage an outbreak of creativity in the city that would come to be seen to be, would, would, would come to the credit of the Boston Book Festival? So here's what we're doing. We're doing it in October. If you're in Boston in October, please come join us. And I'll give you the dates, um, I mean, if you want, the, and the places. But here's the thing. We're going to take out-of-work actors. We're going to give them a scene probably from Glen Gary, Glen Ross. <laughs> we're going to put them in 10 pubs and bars around the city. We're going to dress them as anybody you would see in that pub or that bar. And we're going to have them sit, just enjoy the evening, and then they're going to start doing the scene. And they're going to start in a normal tone of voice. But their voice is su suddenly going to start becoming louder and louder until they're doing the scene full voice, theatrical presentation, suddenly breaks out beside you. You're at a bar just minding your own business. Suddenly, what? And, uh, and we'll see what happens. But the idea is that we, the, 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 the underlying notion here is that a lot of the literature that ends up at the Boston Book Festival came from a bar or a pub of some kind or another. And this is a process by which we send that creativity back to the bar and the pub. The other idea is to reach people where they live. They're not coming to the Boston Book Festival. It's not even on their map. They are going to the bar very much. And to have this breakout beside you makes you go, oh, oh. First it's what? And then it's oh. So that's, uh, that's the plan. So here are, you know, c encourage you please to make a culture matic. Four rules, generally speaking. Tap into the buzz of culture. Zombies would be a great example, though zombies, their day will eventually pass. Because, um, yeah, because actually, yeah. So um, the second, <laughs> I was working for some joke about zombies being incapable of reproducing themselves, but I couldn't, uh, <laughs> couldn't get it. Um, the second rule is turn something on its head. It's like take a security camera and do something completely new with it. The third rule is break the rules of mass marketing, right? This isn't about banging the drum loudly. This is about some funny little counter-expectational outbreak of creativity in a bar. What? And finally, uh, enchant the world in the process. Make good on, on Max Weber's uh, point of view. So some part of culture, this would be a case in point where Khan used uh, zombies. Um, use something that's never been used before. A vending truck, uh, uh, sorry, a vending machine, a food truck, a security camera. You know, as you're scouting through the world, think, oh, that could be something. And uh, David and I were actually talking about, could you get, these are the red caps that rule South Station in Boston. Nothing happens without their, you know, a huge amount of contraband also passes, I think, through their work. They're like the local chieftains. They're like mafia there in South Station. If you could engage them, I mean, they're tough-minded so-and-sos, so engaging them would be really tough. If you could, you could make something absolutely magical happen in Boston. No Bostonian would not hear about doing something interesting with these guys. Uh, it can be very old media. It can be low tech. You can break the rules of mass marketing. Better if you do, because that's how we get into, past that barrier, past that shield, into the heart and the head of the millennial. So summing up, these culture matics are new instruments for experience marketing. They draw on culture. They, they make culture. They're great, I think, for building brands and for creating meaning and value for the client. Thank you very much.